fit four homes in the shop. And we're going to have two trailers coming in about two days. Uh, but pretty much, I like to pre-frame all my walls on one empty area in the shop. Once I can't really do much anymore, then I will set them up, uh, up aside. And then we'll be pulling all our trailers in one by one. Each trailer will pull in. We'll, sh we'll insulate it. We'll sheet it. We'll get the crane. We'll lift each wall one at a time. And we will probably have, you know, our four homes um, all framed up next week. So they go pretty fast. And on the webinar that I was listening to this morning, you were talking about how your trailers are made specially, particularly because of the plumbing. Mm -hmm. Is that well, correct? The plumbing and the structural integrity. But what we do is we have jacks in the middle and jacks on all four corners to ensure that the house is perfectly leveled when we frame. So there's no nothing that is tweaking around while it's getting framed. So um, that's... You know, and so anyway, we built the trailers easier for the plumbing. We built them e uh, better for the uh, support on the bottom for the jacks. We also, the metal liner, yep. weld our metal liners underneath the trailer so they're air nice and tight, so nothing could go inside of it. We powder coat our trailers, we paint them, we make sure that everything is done properly to make sure that it's going to last a lot longer instead of rust. Trailers is a lot of tiny home trailer manufacturers do angle iron. I don't recommend angle iron because one, uh, the insulation is not even underneath your wall there and you know I say every inch counts for insulation but also I have a channel uh, um, I, uh, I, I built underneath the wall the bottom wall plate so I could run my plumbing underneath and throughout the trailer so it's a lot easier and uh, and also another thing the last trailer manufacturer I was with his flaw was um, there was not much space to run your piping around the wheel wells or around the axles of the wheels so I asked him, can we just raise it like three inches? And he just told me to take a hike. But the current manufacturer we have called DNS Trailers, he was said, hands down, oh, that's easy fix. So we raised our metal liner three inches up that we have up to six to eight inches of room uh, above the, wheel, uh, the axle so we can be able to run our plumbing a lot easier. And then one final thing we just upgraded was our tires. Every tiny house trailer that we have will have a, a spare tire with it because who knows, God forbid when you're on the road, you get a flat, but you will have a tire so you're not stuck on the road. Cause... So some of the other tiny houses we've looked at, they've really recommended that you don't move your house very often. They're like, this is not a mobile home in any way. Plunk it where you're going to put it and leave it there. But it doesn't sound like that's really how you feel about your houses. These are meant to be moved occasionally. Well, that's why they're called a tiny home and they're on trailers. I don't know what they're smoking, but <laughs> I don't know why builders are restrictive to that. But they're made to be portable. You know, I have traveling nurses right now. They travel every month with their tiny house. And they, we delivered their house to California. And they end up going straight to New York with their house. No problems whatsoever. Um, they're made to be taken across the country. I had another house too that was taking Rhode Island and back, and that's why I do spare tires. I had a flat tire on the way back. <laughs> that was the only issue we had, but honestly, these houses are made to move and they're made to go across the country. Why buy a portable home then if you can't move it? That just doesn't make sense. One of the other things I appreciated in your webinar was the education of uh, RV parks or of your local city ordinances, your language, which words you use count because some people, they don't know what a tiny house is. And if you say tiny house, they don't know what code to put to it. They don't know, well, you're not allowed in here. You're not an RV. So mm -hmm. you, you had some, you had one guy that you said, told a story about how he came and said, I have a tiny house, but then he came back and showed the wording on his yeah, uh, what happened was he went to a, a modular home park is where he's at. And they said, well, you got to be a park model or a mobile home. And he goes, well, I have a tiny home. And I, he called me up and he says, hey, they won't let tiny homes in here. I said, you know, we registered your home as a park model, right? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, then show them your registration. So he went right back to the mobile home park and showed his registration saying it's a park model. And they said, oh, then come on in. So the thing is... If you mention your house as a tiny home right now, it's just, it's not going to make sense to people or it's not their language. So you need to go, I give it maybe a couple years from now and maybe 
banks will really start accepting them. We'll start getting inspectors who will inspect them. So we will make sure they're all to code because many builders I've, I fear that are not building it to code, but we use licensed and insured con uh, contractors here to do our plumbing electrical. D but despite, we don't use inspectors, but it's imperative that you build them to code for the safety of the customer. But, um, but the thing is, uh, RV parks, mobile home parks, they want that assurance that it's a safe home and that's properly licensed. Even though, even though it may say travel trailer, because even the last uh, trailer manufacturer I worked with, he only uh, did just a trailer or utility trailer um, uh, VIN numbers on his trailers. And even though he's making tiny home trailers, they're not VIN properly. For me, I'm able to get your trailers for an extra eight bucks at the DMV, and I could register them as a park model or as a travel trailer. And we are planning on doing RVIA. I was against doing the RVIA because many of you want to be RV certified, but the problem about being RV certified is that those registrations are made for temporary use. Uh, the laws are that you can only stay in that house part time. And every customer I've sold these homes to are living in them full time. So I would be So you are offering a free course teaching how to make a tiny home safe, which is exceptionally important. You're talking about how some people get into tiny home building, they get halfway through, and then they end up selling it on Craigslist because they it's not safe. They've got moisture in the walls or the electrical isn't right. And so you started out building sheds correct? Mm -hmm. I was a shed builder. A shed builder moved to these, but you're willing to teach people how to do it the right way. Um, any builder can do this as long as they have a system put together. And we're going to show you the system of how it's put together. I'm actually the framer for these walls. So when I'm done framing these on Monday, I really honestly want to start doing our videos where we'll pop in maybe a few videos every other day on our program. So everybody gets educated on how to properly build a tiny home. But I'm going to first start on the planning process, how you draw your plans, how you can hire an architect, how you can uh, go and get your, um, how you save money on your tiny house. Even after uh, I try and keep a system together because I originally started this in my backyard and I think that's how I've seen a lot of other builders do that. They start off in their backyard, but now we have about 12 more homes we got to build and we are very busy that we need a system in place to make sure we keep everybody happy on schedule. So what we do is, as I said before, we frame everything on our floor here and we pre-set up our walls, we pull trailers in, we put the sheet, uh, insulation sheet on the trailers, put our walls on, um, and then after that, we, my, mechanical goes, uh, my mechanical guy goes right behind, he does all the plumbing electrical, and all our houses are in stages, pretty much. We have one house that is in the mechanical stage right here, we have another house in the, in the drywall stage on the one in the corner. And then we got the one in the actual finish stage. I have my painters in there right now doing all the paint work and we're doing all the trim work in that one currently. And, and I remember you were talking about how you don't like the roll in pink insulation. And I see that this does not look like normal insulation. No, not this what is, you're uh, used to. we just insulated a house. And if you want to go inside this one, um, this is called rock sole insulation. The pink stuff's just crap. Uh, the pink stuff, what it is, is just, uh, it, it's a standard type of house insulation a lot of home, uh, homeowners have used on standard homes, but the rock sole is just a lot more environmentally safe. I, I believe it's fireproof as well. It's just, it's all around good insulation for a home. You can take a look at this house right here that we're working on, um, because all the mechanical is already done on the house my guys just start insulating the pink insulation you actually have to staple it into your studs but for this stuff you just cut it and you pop it in you don't even have to staple it it's really easy to put into your house insulation is r15 we can upgrade the insulation to additional r5 to r7 with a solar reflective insulation that we use uh, it just depends on what you want to do. This house, and you so. said you can do the spray in, but you don't like it because it's hard to get your electrical. If you have to change anything, you have to chisel it out and it's a pain. Yeah. But some people are really huge fans of the spray in foamy insulation, like what you do on the yeah, concrete, it's just, right? It's super expensive. And my goal is I'm trying to make these affordable. And the thing is, when you get the spray foam insulation, I have bids anywhere from $2,200 to $3,000 for spray foam to do the floor, wow. the walls, the ceiling 
on a that was on a 28 foot home and uh what but with this all this stuff and if i did the solar reflective insulation the r value of that spray foam i ordered was about r25 to r30 but with the um with this stuff and the solar reflective insulation i was at a r22 to r25 which is re so it's getting close but doesn't have as much of r value but the cost was only about twelve hundred to thirteen hundred dollars for that other insulation I used compared to the spray foam. If I did this insulation instead of the spray foam, but spray foam what I had to pay for, and it was about three thousand I spent, and that's that's just cost. That wasn't even profit for me for doing that. So. Well, and there's so little. The if you have a wood burning stove or something in here, you're already going to be baking yourself out. So adding that much more insulation to a little home. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take that much to heat them because they're not very big in the first place. And I've been in some of my customers' homes in the winter, and they are pretty roasty houses. They, yeah. This stuff has done very well. I had a customer in Colorado that was at negative 5 degrees with just this insulation, and they were perfectly fine. Just from breathing in the house, or what kind of heater were they using? Uh, they Actually, they just had a little uh, space heater in there. Oh. And they didn't I am thinking about making things more propane friendly in our homes because um, more and more of my customers, probably 50% of my customers are ending up to be off grid. Mm -hmm. We've done about nine, eight to nine off grid homes already. And uh, so we're very well familiar on how to be off grid with solar and battery backup systems. And I don't know why people are th think it's so hard to put a battery backup system in because I had bids from other solar companies and the solar builders themselves or the installers themselves they only do tie it to the grid, mm -hmm. and they don't really uh, do a battery backup. But when we put it in, it really wasn't that hard to do. So, um, so we 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 try and include it on our homes for our customers, making it more affordable. Generally, the bids we got from solar companies were about anywhere from twelve thousand to thirteen thousand dollars for off the grid battery backup system for a thousand watts. But for us, we have been able to get it down to six or seven thousand. So uh, it's, it's pretty much half the cost is what you're saving. So the off-grid house, what this consists of, we are going to have our full 1,000-watt solar kit, but we're going to run as much stuff off of propane as we can, the fridge, the AC system, the heater, uh, the uh, water heater as well, and then um, possibly, um, oh yeah, and then we have our stove, and then possibly, I hear you could use propane for the... Um, uh, to, to actually produce electricity if you wanted to, but I just, I don't, I don't want to have it solely propane. We don't want to focus a lot of our electricity on the water catching system, because that's what's using a lot of electricity. So we want to balance it out with the propane um, powered products, and then we're going to have the 1,000 watt solar kit that's going to be powering your lights, your, uh, just your, uh, just maybe your laptop, your lights, and everything. What this water system is, that has been the biggest challenge every customer I have faces is water. They say, I can't get a well, I can't get it approved by the city, I can't get, um, you know, I, I just can't afford getting a well dug or I can't afford getting it dug from the city line to my property. It's anywhere, I've had bids up to $20,000 to put a water line in. Uh, that was in the state of California, it was nuts. Uh, so there is a heavy price to pay for water. So there's a water catching system I found for about $1,500 to $2,000 where what it does, it catches water out of the humidity of the air. And what that does, that can gather up to 15 gallons a day in the state of Utah. And it's really dry here in Utah. And this guy, uh, he's tested it back east and you are able to catch the water about 30 gallons of water a day back east, which is insane. And, um, but you will be using more electricity for it. Um, but, and this is the thing about water catching, that many people want to get it from their roof and let it come from the top of the roof and down the gutter into a, a can, but I saw on Facebook actually recently, there was a guy that he got uh, in trouble with the government, and he, um, I don't know if they arrested him or not, but he got in a lot of trouble because he was off grid and he had a water catching system. And my friend that has this water catching system that catches it out of the humidity, he says the reason why the government doesn't like you catching water and filtering it yourself is because one, you can't be taxed out of it, and number two, 
they believe it's dangerous. Uh, maybe the last thing we were thinking of, which would be cool, because I am closing on a customer that wants to do this off-grid home. I'm hoping we're going to do a deck on the roof. And uh, oh, we've done three homes with decks on the roof before, or, and so we, we know how to do it. We know how to build decks on the roof. But I want to do it in a way where we could put a garden system up there as well, where we can may, probably have the, uh, you put your plants up there, but then when you go travel, I want to have like a clear uh, plate with some holes in it so it could breathe. You could just fold it down and, um, and your plants will be okay while you're traveling. I thought that would be pretty wicked awesome to have that. Then your house is completely sustainable and you can grow your own food and all that stuff. But I know. And the last thing we're going to do on that house is I'm trying to, I want to like to make it as, as green safe as possible where um, everything in that house will be, instead of that insulation, I'm going to get a sheep's wool insulation mm -hmm. and a, um, or a jean insulation where you actually take, they take blue jeans and they shred it and they turn it into insulation. It's 100% environmentally safe that uh, we were thinking about doing that. Then the next thing we want to do is just get hardwood flooring with uh, in, um, uh, it with a special stain that they put on it where it's not going to interfere with your allergies or anything mm -hmm. like that. Just there, uh, basically paint and staining is the most crucial thing in the tiny house for an environmentally safe house. So the paint anyway is instead of spending $30 at Home Depot on a gallon a bucket, this particular paint's about $85 a gallon to $90 a gallon. But you don't have that much space to cover. No, I mean... don't have that much space to cover. <laughs> So for what, what is an, a, I don't know, maybe there's not an average, but for something that would be considered livable for a small family, how much does it cost to get into one of your little homes? Anywhere from like, it really depends on how small you want to go. I had a family, if you see that little house right there, that's seven feet by uh, 18 really feet little. is that house. Yeah. And I sold a six foot by 14 foot home for a family of four. And they basically, um, they had a high rent, about $3,000 a month for their rent. Where were they? Florida, Miami. Holy cow. And uh, but his brother was offering him some land to stay on to help him out. And then they said they could save probably about $3,000 a month uh, for a year. So say that they saved up $36,000 for a year. And then they can go get a bigger tiny house. But the mom and dad and the infant were going to be on a Murphy bed downstairs, and then the, um, the, the toddler would be upstairs in the loft. And I was thinking, how do you guys do that? And they said, well, we just you we just want do. to be out of debt, and they just want to do it that way. So they got tired of paying the man. Hey. And so um, I, um, and another story, I had a couple. They sold, this was the craziest one. They sold a, a house that was a two-bedroom, one-bath for $350,000 in California. And they owned it outright. They were debt-free, but still they wanted a retirement. They had no money for retirement. So they sold that. They got a thirty-thousand-dollar home from us, and then they uh, now they have the money for retirement. For a, they actually they ended up going to Europe after they got the house. So the thing is, um, every customer I found, they end up selling a house, and then they uh, move into one of these because they know it's a lot more affordable and they don't need the large space. Even the last one I just delivered. There was a nice, happy couple. They had a two or 3,000 square foot home and they realized they just don't need it. All they do is travel. So why don't we just sell the house and live tiny and travel more often? Right. Um, one thing that actually does, is the hardest thing in this company for us is uh, we do have people that rush us the last week or two building a home. Even though we could build, we build these pretty quick. That's about a week and a half. That's about two, two and a half weeks to build that one. This one's about two weeks to build this one. And, um, but people are selling their home and they're homeless probably for the last week till we're done building that they stress to us going, get it done, get it done, because we don't have a place to stay. I'm like, well, we have, we have a time constraint, but we try and build them as quickly as we can. But pretty much we experience this every time because people are moving out of what they actually live in and they're, and they're gonna live in one of these full time. And uh, how do you take a look? This is our first time doing skirting around the house. We're gonna do skirting around this one. So uh, for this lady. So I my guy just just painted all his walls up really good. Uh,
we raised the floor on this because she's rolling out a, a full-size bed out of the floor and it's going to go into that room is what we're doing. That's why the floor is raised up. And then, uh, and then she'll have her bathroom down there and then the ladder is just going to go over on that side. And she's going to have a couple kids on this side, a couple kids on the other. And then she's going to sleep on the first floor. And then she's going to have her kitchen all along here. She's going to have her, uh, her stove and her fridge. And then just uh, the sink's going to be all around that end. So it's just a nice laid out house for her. So um, she's not sure if he's, she's going to, she, she, it's more of a um, snowbird house. She's going to live in it in the spring and then uh, be in here in the winter. So but it's pretty cool. It's just, uh, if you're curious, it's about 30 feet for this home. So, so how many total square feet is it? 30 by what? 30 by 8 feet. Do, um, do you need special permitting to get it down the road? No, um, it, it's the, um, the, the code is uh, uh, you have to have your house 100 inches wide and, and, uh, which is, and then 13 and a half feet tall is the maximum height you can do. And then you could, anybody could travel one of these things. But one of my drivers says you will need, probably need a CDL license if you're longer than 40 feet. So if you're, you know, 40 feet or longer, you'll probably need a CDL license. But, um, and I heard, I asked, what is the longest we could go? And I asked the driver, and we could go, probably go up to 60 feet on one of these things. So 60 feet long. And the widest is 40 feet wide on the road. So pretty wide. <laughs> so. And didn't you say that there was, there was a program where you could... Oh, you were saying you don't have to have a monster truck in order to pull it. And I don't remember what you said about uh, it. You ship. You yeah, ship because so they'll come in and get it? Do you have a truck? I would not have to have somebody tow it. Oh, okay. Because the thing is, I tell, you know, for the guys, I tell them, just, you may yell at me because if you're married and you've got a wife and say, oh, well, uh, uh, we don't have to get a truck. <laughs> but maybe husband may not be happy about that. But the thing is, you really don't have to get a truck. Um, there's a website called uship.com and pretty much you can go on there and you could put in, hey, I want to deliver a 30 foot by eight foot house to Idaho or something. And there's professional drivers who are licensed and insured and they pick up the house and they, they take it up to wherever you want. And if anything happens to it, it's on their head, their insurance so even if you're taking it like up the mountains, like kind of the cabin kind mm -hmm. of thing? Like I have a, a dang good driver. I don't know how he does it, but we have a customer. We took, just took a house to to Colorado and sheer driveway was just insane. Like he said, just, it had a lot of twisting switchbacks just to get down there. And it was just a really rough road to get down there. Even my, my he says, uh, you know, or there's a, I had another guy that went out there to help her with her solar. And he says he didn't even want to drive his truck down the driveway. So, And um, speaking of, like warranties and stuff like for drivers too, I had a I had a house that we just took to Washington, and uh, it's in Washington now. But my driver, everything was perfect until the last 50 feet, and when he got there, he hit a tree at the last 50 feet and knocked out the elbow on our solar. So driver's covering it. We had our we I just called up a handyman. Oh, and actually, an electrician for that one. Got this electrician going out and he's repairing it right now. And um, actually, it was just some loose wiring, is what it was on that house. That now we can swap it out. But it's so stuff like that happens when you deliver your tiny house, you got to watch the trees and make sure, even despite we're, we're to code at 13 and a half feet high, but still, you know, if you hit something and you got to get, get it fixed. Because we did a. Uh... We did a deck, um, uh, you know, have you seen the tiny homes where you have like a deck in the back and they put all like the, the, uh, the basically the uh, mini split system back there, the propane mm -hmm. tanks yeah. and all that fun stuff back. But I had some comments, people saying, is someone going to steal that stuff? And I go, you know what, that's a pretty good possibility. So I decided instead of having the deck in the back, why don't we fully enclose it? So we have a two, uh, so if someone orders a 24 foot home for me, I technically give you a 26 foot home because what I do is I extend it two feet for the utility closet in the back and I extend the loft out two feet so the loft is sticking out. So as you open these really beautiful doors that we have here, um, 
it's not completely enclosed with the sheets yet, but we have all this store, uh, uh, this closet here for all utilities. We're gonna have the water in here. We are gonna have, if it's a solar kit, we could fit a water heater, a solar kit, and water tanks inside this closet. So everything is in one spot because when I first started this, I had all my utilities and stuff all over the place in the tiny house. So say if someone wants to manage something on their utilities, they got to figure out wait, where the heck do they put that? But if they have issues with your utilities, you'll always remember it's in one spot. It's just you open, you go over the front of the house, open the doors and everything is right here in front of you. Even the breaker boxes and everything is inside this closet. I just think it's a lot more efficient and easier to maintain it and uh, um, everything that you need in your tiny house. And thank this is a cool house, it's pretty small, um, but he's going to have like a, a stove here, he's going to have his sink here, and then TV mount's going to go here. His queen size Murphy bed is going to fold down here, so he'll have his queen Murphy bed here. And then um, we we'll have a pipe ladder going up this side. We brought the wall in a little bit on this side so we can have a pipe ladder going up this side. And then have just enough room for his queen size bed to come down. This house is pretty small, but he's getting a lot of house for what he's got. This is going to have a, uh, a solar kit on it. This will be off grid with solar tanks. Uh, separate compost toilets going to go there. Um, you know, and the thing is, he's, he lives alone, so. If you're a bachelor, this is like a perfect house, you know, for everything you got. So. It is funny that the centerpiece is what's really important here. Is the TV. The TV is almost bigger than the bed. <laughs> yeah. So. Mind if I look around the what isn't going to be a bathroom, but it's going to be a... Yeah. So, so. he has a full shower. Yep. You got your full shower stall and your toilet. And the composting and... toilet. Yeah, Pretty lots, cool. Lots of room. When I was single, I wanted to live in something like this. Now I have two kids, and I've decided there's such a thing as a space that is too small. <laughs> yeah. This is pretty cool. Yeah. Good deal. The thing is about these trailers is that what makes the biggest difference, you can't really see it too much, but there's a jack in the middle over there. There's a jack here. There, Each jack is rated of 5,000 pounds of jack. There's like a, a really solid metal liner that we have underneath that... Um, that is uh, that just mounted underneath and welded. Lots of room under the uh, above the. I wonder if I can show that. Lots of room above the uh, the axles. Um, it's just it's an all around solid trailer that we have here. The framing is a little bit more thicker and beefier than the last uh, the last ones we used. We upgraded the axles because the owner of the last trailer company I used, he. Um, uh, he just went bare minimum on his trailers. If I told him I want a 20 foot trailer, he only gets a trailer rated at about 12,000 pounds, two 6K axles, but the house is only gonna weigh about 11,000 pounds. That means you only have a thousand pound difference. And the thing is, you can put a lot of live and dead loads inside of a house to add up to a thousand pounds. Yeah. So we, if we do a 20 foot trailer, I rated at 14,000 pounds. I put two 7K axles on that one. Uh, when it comes to the, uh, uh, it, just even this trailer, this one is rated at th uh, 21,000 pounds. These are three 7K axles that we put on this trailer, uh, just so the customer is able to, because uh, um, the house is probably only going to weigh about 15 and a half to 16,000 pounds on this. And, um, and uh, so that means she has, you know, six, five or 6,000 pounds she could play with with this house. Because you're.